Good morning. Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Community Breakfast. Thanks so much for coming out. In case any of you didn't notice, today is the first day of summer, officially. <laughs> you would have think it started maybe 10 days ago. But uh, anyway, thank you for braving the heat and coming out this morning. I'm Wyatt Decker. I'm the CEO of Mayo Clinic, and I'm an emergency medicine physician at Mayo as well. It's uh, with uh, a lot of excitement that we'll present today's panel. And I, uh, before we get started, I wanted to introduce a few of our distinguished guests today. If you could uh, stand as we acknowledge you. Senator Nancy Bartow is here. Senator, thank you. The mayor of Scottsdale, Mayor Jim Lane, is here. Mayor, welcome. Councilman Jim Waring, Councilman, thank you for joining us. We have uh, two of our Valley Police Chiefs here today. Please stand and be acknowledged. Thank you for providing safety. Thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge the Executive Director of the Arizona Medical Association, Mr. Chick Older, who is on a victory tour. He's preparing to retire. We won't let him, but he thinks he's going to retire. And I'd also wanted to mention that we'll be streaming this on Facebook Live, so we'll have uh, many viewers who are not here physically who will be watching us on social media. And the theme for today's discussion is going to be the neurosciences, but I would also just take it up a notch and say, really, as you're going to hear, the theme is innovation in healthcare. And we hear so much about the challenges of healthcare, and they're real. Uh, today, there are many medical conditions that have become chronic and debilitating diseases for which we don't have good solutions. That, in turn, is driving incredible costs in healthcare, combined with a healthcare system that's overly fragmented. And we believe that the solutions can be multifaceted, but, but a fundamental way to approach the challenges in healthcare in the United States today is to think differently about the problems and to say how do we create answers tomorrow for the challenges that we face today and we'll focus on the neurosciences but just to share with you that at Mayo Clinic we have taken this approach to a, a whole host of conditions and categories of diseases. So we've launched three what we call transformative centers to help design solutions for medical problems. One example is precision medicine or what we sometimes internally call individualized medicine. And at Mayo Clinic, we've, for 150 years, we've recognized that every patient is unique and that the physician and the team that takes care of that patient has to take the time to understand their unique situation because no one is straight out of the textbook. Every patient has some subtle uh, attributes that are unique. But now we're taking it to the next level by using the genome, the human genome, to help drive that care and make sure that we're giving the best medications and the best care for those patients. So the Center for Individualized Medicine is driving the incredible advances that have occurred nationally and internationally in genomics to the bedside so that it makes a difference in healthcare. We have another center that we've launched on regenerative medicine. And this sounds science fiction-like, but we actually have a lab here in Phoenix that can take adult tissue from your fat or your bone marrow and re-engineer it into whatever tissue is needed for the human body. And every year, thousands of people die waiting for organ transplants because we can't get an appropriate match for an organ. We are, by far and away, the largest transplanter of solid organs in the state of Arizona. And we're very proud to serve our state's citizens in this way. But we also recognize that we would like to see a better solution in the future for those who either don't have organs, and even those who do, it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated, high-risk procedure when somebody receives a solid organ. So what if you could create tissue engineering in a lab from their own body and create the cells that their organs need to continue to function? And that's the goal of this work. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. And then the third center is really a center for the science of healthcare delivery. And in partnership, and all of these centers actually are, are leveraging the Mayo Clinic ASU Alliance for Healthcare. 
uh, but in particular, this notion of big data. And I know we have some colleagues in the audience today from Arizona State University, and they're helping us move the envelope in rapidly combing through unbelievably large data sets to gain insights that allow us at Mayo Clinic and elsewhere to take better care of our patients. So these are three centers that are moving rapidly to find meaningful solutions in healthcare. Lastly, we are very, very proud to announce that we will be launching the first class of the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine based in Scottsdale. These will be 50 Mayo Clinic medical students who will be rotating not only at Mayo Clinic, but at Phoenix Children's Hospital, at Maricopa Integrated Medical Center, at Health Mountain Park Health Center, and other Valley healthcare providers. So these students will represent a new breed of doctors, doctors that not only are compassionate and technically excellent, but doctors who understand the healthcare system, because in addition to getting an MD degree, they'll be getting a certificate, and for those who choose a master's degree in the science of healthcare delivery from Arizona State University while they get their MD. So we believe that this is an opportunity to create a whole generation of doctors who understand the nation's healthcare system and the healthcare system that they're in and can actually help redesign it and make it better and more effective and more efficient at delivering results for our patients. So we're very, very excited about that. So I'd like to introduce our team today that we will we'll be uh, enjoying hearing about the insights in innovations in neurosciences. First, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Joe Dana, known to many of you as the Emmy Award-winning anchor of the 4 p.m. news on Channel 12. Joe, could you raise your hand? I saw you. Oh, right here. He's ready to go. Joe, welcome. <laughs> With him will be the chair of neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Bernard Bendock. Dr. Bernard Bendock received his medical training at Northwestern University in Chicago. He is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in neurovascular malformations and their repair in skull-based tumors. And he's also known around the country and the world for his innovations in simulation science and education. And as you, you may be hearing in more detail from him that uh, what, if, what if surgeons, instead of learning on a patient, could learn even an exact operation in a laboratory or a simulated setting before they ever touch the patient. And it's an incredibly exciting advance that, uh, that we're helping to pioneer at the Mayo Clinic. With him will be colleague Dr. Kristen Swanson. Dr. Swanson is a PhD in theoretical or what, what we call oncological mathematics. Now, how many of you have ever heard of, of cancer mathematics? She is one of, of a very rare few in the country and the world who are taking mathematical modeling and bringing it to these complex fields such as brain tumors and applying it not only to help us understand globally how to predict how a tumor might behave, but also at an individual basis. What if each person, instead of having a well-intended doctor giving a ballpark of what might happen if they do this surgery or that intervention, what if we had a mathematical model that actually predicted what was going to happen? And she's been doing this cutting-edge research, again, right here at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And then in route uh, is our ASU colleague, uh, Dr. Stephen Helms Tillery. Dr. Helms Tillery is an associate professor at ASU and is a national expert in the interface between cognition and the movement of limbs. And he is helping to pioneer the ability to build and create with bioengineering and neurophysiology uh, uh, mentally powered robotic limbs and other prostheses. So he'll be joining, he's stuck in traffic, so he'll hopefully be joining us a little later today. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Joe to the podium and our distinguished guest. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Good morning, everyone. While our guests are coming up, can you hear me okay? Welcome to the Facebook Live viewers as well, and thanks to the Phoenix Art Museum for hosting this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my son, he just ended a, a, what was a two-month campaign to try to convince his parents to, to have a chicken coop in our backyard. And part of his argument was, he said, Dad, uh, chickens are smarter than, than four-year-old humans. Did you know this? And we, we started a two-hour conversation at the dinner table researching uh, intelligence of chickens versus humans, and actually 
found some fascinating studies, one showing that in a very narrow test, they did actually fare better than four-year-old children on a very specific intelligence test. But this opened up this wonderful discussion about types of intelligence in the brain and the difference between executive functioning and creative intelligence and memorization. And I was also very impressed with how much they've already learned in school about the different areas of the brain. And I'm convinced uh, as a journalist and, and just as a father that the more we can talk about brain health and the latest brain science at the dinner table or uh, in the media uh, or in the classrooms and in forums like this, the better off we will be to educate ourselves to, to face these daunting challenges that we face in society uh, related to the economy and uh, health care and so many other challenges that, uh, that I cover every day in the news. So I want to start with a quote that I know uh, you're very passionate about, Doctor, and just ask you to maybe comment on this. This is by a, a brain scientist, Mishu Kaku, who said, the human brain has 100 billion neurons, each neuron connected to 10,000 other neurons. Sitting on your shoulders is the most complicated object in the known universe. Your thoughts? Well, <coughs> So uh, that is one of my most favorite quotes, and I always felt that uh, from when I was a medical student that humanity has two amazing frontiers. Uh, the, the Homo sapiens, a human species, has always been passionate about new frontiers. To, to this day, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a riddle. Why did that small colony of Homo sapiens in Africa leave and populate the planet? It's a bit of a, a riddle. And I think it has to do with something in our genes that always wants to make us explore new frontiers. Along those lines, I think that uh, the two amazing frontiers for humanity are the brain, the most sophisticated computer in the universe that we know of so far, and, and space. And if you think about the moon mission, one could argue that was a huge expense, uh, could have been spent on other things. But on the other hand, the downstream technology that developed from the moon mission really has led to a lot of improvements. Every one of us carries a cell phone today. Some of that came out of the moon mission. And when you think about what we learn from the brain, if we can ad advance our knowledge, which is still very primitive, actually, in brain science, imagine what that will do to enhance life, to enhance health, to enhance longevity. If you think about the, the enterprise of human health over the last 200 years, we've really managed through a number of efforts to really uh, reduce illness, to make people live longer. We're living much longer than human beings have ever lived, but the new goalpost uh, is to make people live better, with better quality of life. We can make people live to 100 now. Who knows, with the, some secret Mayo research, we may be living to 200 soon. Uh, but the question is, with what brain function, with what quality of life? And that really is an exciting frontier for us to engage, and I think it will drive a lot of innovation, a lot of opportunity for Arizona and Phoenix to be at the cutting edge of that, uh, what I would call, revolution. Dr. Swanson? Yeah, so I guess the, the thing that I noted um, from that quote, which Bernard does use all the time, because uh, it's, a, it's a great quote, um, is, is, the, uh, is the concept that this is the largest computer, our biggest behemoth computer one can dream of, right? Um, and at the end of the day, what that means is the brain, there are rules within the brain, right? The brain is not just some com so, something so complex that we can't wrangle it. But we do have tools. We do have approaches to be able to wrangle that. And it's, isn't it a natural place for a mathematician? So um, that's what the, 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 the seat I fill in this conversation. Um, how you can really truly innovate, I think, in terms of making accurate understanding and accurate predictions for individual patients in the future relies on better quantitative understanding of what's actually happening in this very complex but ultimately quantitative system. Right? We can, we can uh, connect these millions and millions and billions and billions of neurons and their thousands and thousands of connections um, through these, these paradigms. And so I think that'll, that'll set up nicely some of the discussion later. I, I just see a lot of advances in this general area of computational neuroscience using uh, computation meets our understanding of brain cancer, brain. And we'd like to invite our Facebook viewers, if you have questions, to log them in and we'll relay them here to the stage as well. From a healthcare perspective, for the, the average uh, viewer out there, uh, audience member, what could you tell us about one very specific new development that you see as an exciting forefront that you specifically are working on? Well, well one of the areas we're passionate about is the idea of simulating the disease. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the history of surgery, let's say it's just one m microcosm of healthcare, 
uh, it used to be the old adage that arose in the early 20th century, actually pioneered by the Mayo brothers and others, is, is do one, see one, do one, teach one. So the idea that you would create a, an educational environment in a hospital where you would teach by watching a mentor, uh, and you learned how to do surgery by studying anatomy, let's say. You know that you turn right by the museum, left by the symphony, and you arrive at a certain restaurant. Well, now with GPS, you basically can sit in the back seat eventually and uh, get to your destination. And similar with surgery, one, one exciting frontier is the idea of precision surgery, individualized surgery, or what I like to call image-guided surgery. So there's a, a revolution that's coming that I think Arizona and Phoenix can be a part of, and that's the idea of merging the advances in imaging, which can now can image those five to 10,000 connections that each neuron has. Imagine this, imagine if you had 5,000 Facebook friends, your life would be in chaos, but every neuron can manage 10,000 connections, and it's thought now that when we engage art, we build more connections. When we, uh, when we engage music, we may engage more connections. So when we see a patient who's a musician or an artist, we need to treat them differently than a patient who may be uh, a, a construction worker, let's say, or a, uh, or, or a teacher. They may be using a different part of their brain. So how we get to a tumor has to be individualized based on what the person does because their tracks, their highways are different. We can't just follow the old Google map. We have to follow a dynamic, real-time map. So I think, uh, to answer your question, one, and there are many examples, but one exciting uh, example of a, a, a frontier that's an opportunity for Arizona and Phoenix is this idea of individualizing what we understand about the brain so we can uh, individualize the therapy, whether it's medical or surgical. And as going a step further, if, if we're gonna see a patient from Asia, let's say, who's coming to Phoenix to hopefully enjoy the museum and the symphony and, and come to Mayo Clinic, perhaps, uh, we need to do their operation before they come. So the old, the old uh, approach was just come and we'll see what happens. But imagine if we can print the patient's pathology or simulate it in a hologram, understand the individual tracks that patient has, perform the operation, not just the surgeon, but the entire team, so that when the patient comes, you already know them. Or you can tell them, actually, you don't need an operation. You can just stay home and imagine the anxiety, because when you di get diagnosed with a brain problem, it is a huge psychological burden. It's, when you have a tumor in your brain, no one wants to ever have a tumor anywhere, but something about the brain is, ve is, a, is a big toll. Uh, but imagine we can tell somebody, listen, don't, don't take that flight from China. Uh, we'd love to see you, but we can actually manage you remotely because you actually don't need surgery because for whatever. We just did a study at Mayo Clinic showing that about 20 to 40%, I believe, of patients who have are misdiagnosed in the world, that world. So that's another, actually another, I'm sidetracking here. But this all relates, the idea of taking healthcare beyond just that office visit, but really starting to look at Phoenix and Arizona as a hub that's networked throughout the world, being able to deliver healthcare remotely and then to simulate an operation or a medical therapy or radiation therapy. That's where actually Dr. Swanson comes in, being able to use sophisticated mathematics to be able to simulate that operation before it happens. So I think I'm going to ask for that second slide, um, even though I said I was never going to use it. Um, so to follow, follow this exact conversation, not the first slide, that one. There you go. Go ahead and walk through this. Uh, so to visualize what exactly Bernard was talking about is imagine you have a patient comes in, and this is the, dis this is the uh, foot family around that, around that patient. And we're trying to make a decision for what's the best care for that individual patient. And there's the uh, image of the pa patient's brain tumor, red. Red is the lesion on imaging. Um, and the surgical team, they have their plan, and they're going to come in on day 20 and treat the patient with uh, a temporal lobectomy, which you'll see simulated in just a moment. And then click, a, click forward. And then um, from day, let's say, 45 to day 80, is gonna, the patient's going to receive radiation therapy. And this is the standard approach to radiation therapy. This is conformal beam radiation therapy. But we can also be more sophisticated and choose different choices in this particular point. Um, and then in the, this particular patient example, this patient never received chemotherapy. Um, so we'll, we'll not show you any chemotherapy. Um, but having a predictive patient-specific understanding, if you click one more, Having a predictive patient-specific understanding of this red curve is the actual tumor evolution for that individual patient. We converted from MAC to, P to uh, PC, so it's not as pretty as it usually is. Um, but you can see that the radiation is shrinking away the tumor and then recurring. And this is the red curve of that predicted path for that individual patient. 
So now let's individualize this. Let's think about this a little bit more broadly, right? If, you're, if you have a hurricane, which we actually do have a couple storms in the Gulf right now, right? And uh, we are living in New Orleans and we'd like to know if we should evacuate. Um, the challenge is watch those individual curves, right? You get a general curve that looks not something not unlike this curve on the bottom, uh, you, but it's more of a straight line. Um, and you get a straight line curve for a prediction of where that hurricane is gonna land. Um, and you make decisions about given that information, right? So in, now, Underlying those, that, those predictions are, are phys atmospheric models, basically physical models of how the atmosphere works. The atmosphere is like everything else. Everything else fundamentally falls down to physics, and so we can all write it down in terms of equations. So we can write down simple equations to describe the, the rules of those systems, and we can use those rules to predict what's going to happen next in individual patients. So in this case, this is a more sophisticated one where I said the, the dashed line would be where the hurricane was going to go, and look how far off path this patient was as a result of that treatment. So how much f further below the, the uh, dashed line was the patient from this hurricane path. So what that means is that in a indiv patient individualized way, you can generate not only, hey, prior to treatment, prior to even the patient coming from China, for instance, um, in Bernard's example, you can prior, prior to treatment know that this is the, the expected path, this is what we expect, th how things to, to, uh, to go for this individual patient. And what if we tro chose a different surgical approach? What if we chose a proton beam instead of um, conformal radiation that was in this example? What if we added chemotherapy onto this story? So having a patient individualized understanding of the disease evolution in this way, I think really will um, change how we approach individual patient care. Um, but I think it also requires a paradigm shift in how we approach patient, patient care. Because ultimately patient care comes down to averages, right? So uh, individualized medicine is the opposite of that. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we, we still have curves of groups of seemingly similar patients. And I think as we strive, uh, which we were definitely doing here at, here at Mayo Clinic, uh, towards that individualized goal, um, I think that's where a real frontier will be traversed. Yeah. Comes down to averages spoken like a true mathematician, right? So I think it is exciting for a lot of us to hear that with the presence of the Mayo Clinic, we can be a leader in neuroscience, uh, you know, around the country. Where would you say we do stack compared to other cities? Uh, I think, first of all, I think we're doing great. And I think that there are a lot of innovations coming out of uh, Arizona and Phoenix uh, from Mayo Clinic and other institutions. Uh, but I think even more uh, importantly, our potential is uh, phenomenal. I, I came from Chicago, which is a very innovative city, and, and obviously I've con I connect with colleagues around the world, and people have their eye on Phoenix and Arizona for innovation for a number of reasons. I think it's um, the environment here is very conducive. Uh, you get the sense when you walk around and travel around that the sky's the limit, so to speak. It's not as you're not quote-unquote literally landlocked in terms of whether figuratively or, or structurally, in terms of what you want to do. And so I think that this coming together of entrepreneurs, there's an influx of entrepreneurs now from California and elsewhere. The, the, the things that have happened at ASU, for example, Mayo Clinic investing heavily in the Valley and others, I think that is all come together as a perfect storm for and a catalyst for innovation. I also think the, the Mayo ASU, ASU Alliance, I think, sh speaks to that, right? The, the behemoth of um, amazing talent that lives in the vast <laughs> density of ASU in combination with the clinical translation available within Mayo Clinic, I think is a real powerhouse, and, some, in my opinion. Some people talk about Phoenix uh, being a, a new city, uh, and it is, and that has some downside for those perhaps who enjoy uh, a city like New York, let's say. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also an opportunity to develop something new. Sometimes when you're in a in a, whether it's a country or a city that's very established, you tend to get ossification of processes. And ossification of processes can sometimes be the antithesis of innovation. You think about the Mayo brothers picking up with a very low budget, running to the East Coast every summer, flying their planes, studying the wreckage back in their shop in Ohio. That actually, uh, some of you may know the story, uh, superseded a formal project run by the government uh, that was funded and run over the Hudson River where the challenge there was every time the plane crashed, they, they, they followed a more traditional route to innovation. They would fly planes over the Hudson River. It was a $100,000 grant from the government. And, uh, nothing against the government, by the way, but uh, it, 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 the, the planes crashed and they could not pick up the wreckage because it was underwater. I think here in Arizona, there is a certain spirit of innovation that's growing and evolving that allows us to study the wreckage because we can make some, in innovation, you have to make some mistakes. There has to be a certain tolerance to mistakes and a certain tolerance to creativity. 
and, a, and, and embracing a very important issue. I think that innovation comes from when, you, when worlds crash together. You think about great art, it's sometimes different schools of art coming together, as you see in this museum, that sometimes lead to a, a renaissance, quote unquote. And when you have ASU uh, uh, clash, not clashing, but merging, or merging is the wrong word, but uh, coming together with Mayo Clinic to innovate with that sole purpose. They're not coming together for uh, other hidden agendas, but really for the idea of innovation. I think amazing thing, things start to happen. When I, you know, we've met with the bioengineering department there, and they've come, and they have these amazing things going on. But we have the clinical engine to be able to put it into context or drive that innovation uh, because of what we know about the disease or the patient population, et cetera. It, it uniquely poises us because um, the val you know people in the world of pharmacology, right? For, for, pharmaceuticals, right, so say drugs, drugs that are developed in the lab and end up in the clinic. Um, there's what's considered a valley of death, and that's probably true for any innovation, right? Um, that there's some discovery, and isn't it great? We published it in a paper, and now what? Um, and we move on, the lab moves on, right, but the clinical world doesn't, right? And so they don't get the, reap the benefit of that, because this valley of death is challenging to, to traverse. But having strong relationships like that, um, that cross all the way from the basic sciences all the way into the clinical translation is, is is where, how we counter the valley of death with regard to how do we deliver new innovations, whether it's some new molecule, some new device, whatever it is, into the clinic. Um, and I think uh, we are really uniquely poised in that uh, uh, compared to other cities. A lot of other cities um, that are, you know, I was in Chicago, I was in Seattle, um, there's an environment less of collaboration and more of um, competition, I think. And I think that uniquely poises us for the future. The greatest obstacle you face in reaching some of these goals? Well, I'll tell you just a short story. Uh, I don't want to embarrass Dr. Decker, but I'll bring his name up. Uh, so the concept for our lab actually started out with Dr. Swanson's lab in Chicago, and on my side, a closet. It was an unused space that we started developing this concept. And the idea is to leapfrog innovation. The idea is that there are traditional routes to innovation. For example, you could take an animal model of disease and follow a very traditional path of testing drugs. Let's say and that could take 10 to 20 years. By the time the drug develops, it's already outdated. On the other hand, what I, where I, if you could simulate the disease with physical models, computer models, you may be able to get to an answer within a couple weeks. So what we've done in the lab is to bridge an important link. And that link is we have a lot of brilliant minds in America who have great ideas, but they sit in garages with no funding. Uh, some of them make it, uh, some of them, many of them don't. And then you have big companies that have the resources, but they have low tolerance for innovation. And so we've tried in our lab as a microcosm to build a microcosm that can be that link between innovative startup companies or a, a scientist, a shy scientist sitting at ASU who has this brilliant idea, and then translation. And that is an important missing gap in healthcare that has been an obstacle to innovation that I think can be overcome in Phoenix and Arizona. Bringing the researcher, the scientist. Putting them side by side, breaking yes. down those barriers. If you look at our lab, and I'd love for all of you to come visit, it's basically a very open space. Dr. Decker helped us design it and build it, and it was really designed much like a Google space where there are no traditional offices. A, a, a surgeon can rub shoulders with a bioengineer, a mathematician, and that, when those worlds clash, you start to get innovation. If I work alone in my own silo, uh, I can have great ideas, but um, I'm not going to be able to develop them as, as fast. And, and, and right now, the, the curve of innovation, as you all know, is accelerating. If you look at patents over the last 100 years, patents used to be single authored 100 years ago. Current path, and the number of authors on a patent now has mushroomed over the last 30 years. And that's not because uh, people have gotten lazy and want to have people help them. It's because it's gotten harder and harder to come up with a great innovation on your own. You have to think, what kind of architect or what kind of how can I bring multiple ideas together to leapfrog that innovation story and not follow the traditional path necessarily? Not that there isn't value in tradition, but we have to be uh, flexible to bridge the best of tradition, which we do at Mayo Clinic, and the best of innovation. We want to welcome Dr. Helms Tillery, Stephen Helms Tillery, a neurophysiologist at ASU. I know you're stuck in traffic, so welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to be late. Yeah, I'll, I'll let much. you also, if you don't mind, uh, just giving sort of an, an elevator speech here of what you're most excited about in the work you're doing at ASU. Well, so we have a, a large group at ASU that's very focused on developing um, technologies for neural interfaces and um, various neural uh, 
enhancements and assistance to rehabilitation. So the main sort of focus that we've had traditionally at ASU has been on development of interfaces to the nervous system that you could use to run a computer, to run a robotic arm or prosthetic hand, that kind of thing, or uh, to interface to a prosthetic eye, and to enable a person who's lost some kind of function to be, have some functionality restored to them. And um, lately, though, we've also, it, this, this is an area with a lot of problems, of course. We have um, uh, the, the main, the physical interface to the system. We have interpretation and data analysis of the signals that are coming out of the brain. Um, development of methods to put information back into the nervous system. So anything from DBS, and people here certainly are familiar with that, but also mechanisms to provide vision or uh, somatic sensation and tactile sensation. Um, and so we have a lot of work in that. We've been working in, um, in, in animal models, uh, uh, rats and primates, but also some of these technologies are now moving into humans in research in Texas and in Arizona. So uh, that's very exciting. And then we have some new projects coming on board now um, using non-invasive methods to enhance um, plasticity and attention. And so the idea is basically that we know that there are certain uh, neuromodulatory systems that can be used to, to enhance sort of function of the brain and to sort of tap into plasticity. And we think that we can first off use those systems to uh, enhance performance in people who are already sort of peak performance. And so we have this big interest in, say, for example, uh, war fighters, and to give them just a little bit edge of performance in terms of attention, perception, decision making, all these kinds of elements. And the technologies that we're developing to do that, we think, will be tap into systems uh, that enhance norepinephrine and dopamine. And so with an enhancement of norepinephrine and dopamine, we can get enhanced attention, and we think um, enhanced neuroplasticity. So we can see all kinds of applications, for example, in rehabilitation from traumatic brain injury, from stroke, and these kind of things. So we have a lot of stuff going on right now, and hopefully we'll touch on little pieces of it as the, as the panel discussion goes on. Thank you, though. Is there a particular frontier, whether it relates to PTSD or tumor research or other neurodegenerative diseases, dementia, where you feel like you're on the cusp of a breakthrough? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, so um, that's uh, one of the reasons I came, I'm, I hope this is true, so let's just go with it, right? Uh, so this is one of the reasons I came to Mayo Clinic two years ago was uh, exactly this reason. Um, we had been working in the lab for many, many years about developing this idea that you could individualize care, right? So. I, using these computational mathematical approaches. So I didn't really describe that all that well, so I think I'll revisit that just a, a moment to, to get to the point. Um, so if you're sitting um, you know, at a table with a family member who has been just diagnosed with the disease, right? Um, having sat in that position, unfortunately, way too many times in my life, and that's actually what led me to this, this career, is um, you notice something I think really important, which is clinical decisions have to be made by some knowledge, right? And that knowledge comes in the form of clinical trials. So clinical trials is, hey, let's get together a group of 50, 100, 1,000, whatever the number is, I seemingly identical or similar patients, and put them into this cohort, and we're gonna treat them in treatment A. And then we're gonna look at treatment B as the comparison, right? And so ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not this patient got a big bang for their buck for this therapy, or this patient did. It's on average, there's a long curve, of these, sur these survival curves that you compare. And success of the clinical trial is, oh, those survival curves scooch away from each other. And that could be a small, small distance between them or it could be a very large distance between them. In the case of brain cancer, primary brain tumors that I work on, known as glioblastomas, the median survival is something like 16, 18 months, if you're lucky. Um, and uh, in, the, in several studies, but not all studies is my point by the lucky. Um, and the differences that are transformative are measured in weeks, right? So the thing that changes standard way we approach patients on average is measured by, oh, the survival, curve the survival curve scooched out weeks, handful of weeks, maybe two handfuls of weeks. Um, so it's a very small, um, moving the bar, moving the needle very, very small, uh, very small distance. Okay. At the base, the clinical decisions are made by this homogenous, homogenization approach, where you cohort patients, everybody at that table gets treatment A, everybody at that treatment table gets treatment B, and that's the comparison. When we know every single person at your table is different, right? And so how do we get down to that individualized way? How do we de debunk and reapproach individualized medicine um, to take into account that individual 
path, individual path for each patient. But you have to know what that individual path is. And I think that's where the math comes in. Because at the end of the day, the world is all physics, right? Everything around us is physics. And there are some rules, right? It's not, we're not the way we are from, for complete happenstance. There are rules to the system that created us and we can apply simplistic versions or complex versions of those rules to our understanding of, let's say, tumor biology. And that's what we do. So coming to Mayo Clinic two years ago was about how do we transform the research that we've been doing over the last 10 years, um, talking about Bernard's comment about it takes 20 years to do anything, um, is, is to uh, transform that into the clinic, right? So we are at the cusp of being able to say, well, at that table, only two patients get a big bang for their buck from the standard surgery, so maybe we should look at different surgical approaches. And there's only two other patients that really get a bang for their buck from, from that big, from this other standard care therapy, let's say radiation. And there's only two other patients that get a really big bang for their buck um, for, uh, let's say, the standard chemotherapy. The point is, is being able to distinguish who those patients are and peel them out and assign them to, the, to or match them with the right therapies is the future. That is the whole concept behind individualized medicine, whether it's targeting based on some genomic understanding of the disease <coughs> or some pragmatic, you know, phenotypic understanding of what the disease was going to do under this therapy versus that therapy. So having tools to be able to do that and um, transform that, uh, that's where we are right now at Mayo Clinic, uh, working on that both on the uh, surgical end and the radiation therapy end. <laughs> one, of, one of you else like to comment on it? <laughs> Go ahead. So um, uh, the right patient at the right time with the right doctor. And uh, that one of, the, one of the sweet spots we were very proud of at Mayo Clinic is the idea of I told you earlier about bringing ideas together, whether it's scientists. It's also about bringing different doctors from different disciplines together, that idea of a team taking care of you. And in and, and my field and men, in all fields of healthcare, we can actually predict what treatment you're going to get based on which doctor you go to. I'm not talking about Mayo Clinic, I'm talking about worldwide. So if a patient has a brain tumor, you can almost predict whether they're going to get surgery or radiation based on which center they go to, because at most centers, depending on which doctor you see, if you see the person with a hammer, they're going to use a hammer. If you see the person with a screwdriver, they're going to use a screwdriver. Whereas what a patient really needs is to navigate this complex array of options these days. And that's, I think, where artificial intelligence is going to start coming in. So that you're not, you as a patient or your loved one, isn't a victim or subject of biases that are inherent in, hu in human nature. That uh, we see this sometimes in children with ADD, for example. If you go to one practitioner, they believe in drugs. Another practitioner believes in counseling. And perhaps the truth is somewhere in the middle. Well, if you come to Mayo Clinic, you're going to see the expert in pharmacotherapy, but also in counseling and group therapy. And that team is going to be able to bring the best of that world together for you uh, into, into one. So even though it doesn't sound high tech, where it's going to become high tech is when we layer onto that 150-year-old Mayo model of team-based care, artificial intelligence is going to give us tools that are mathematically based. So uh, when my colleague here develops a brain-computer interface, how do we know how, how to dial it up or down? It's going to be mathematical circuits that we're going to have to understand better. Going back to your question on dementia, one of the exciting uh, things that has happened in the last decade is the understanding. This was actually by happenstance. There was a surgeon who was placing a deep brain stimulator, a little electrode that can stimulate an area of the brain electrically because the brain at the end of the day is an electrical structure, electrical system. Uh, and by, by chance, that person remembered a date they had had with their first love when they were 18. This person was in their 60s. And it was a, an amazing memory for that person, and that person was just so happy that they could remember that incident. A lot of skepticism arose about that. It wasn't an intended experiment. It was just by, by accident. Uh, this happened in Toronto. And the investigators became so fascinated that they went on to interrogate multiple family members and people and that that relationship had indeed happened, and it was a very uh, 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 bright moment in that person's memory, but they had completely forgotten because of dementia. They had forgotten that person. And from that, that uh, uh, you know, m much like uh, Edison said that the electrical bulb was a thousandth error he made, from that error, sometimes, sometimes innovation is a eureka moment. The team has capitalized on that, so now we're studying the electrical circuits in that limbic system that we call that drives memory. So I envision five to ten years from now, we're going to be able to put stimulators from ASU, developed perhaps at ASU, into the brain to drive areas where there are deficits, and it's going to be image-guided. So let's say for the future of brain tumor surgery, 
we're going to be able in the next generation of operating rooms, we're now building out hybrid image-guided ORs at, uh, at Mayo Clinic, where we're going to be able to see the tissue we're operating on in real time, not an old image, but in real time. So if we're injecting a drug into the brain that is treating, a, a let's say, a degenerative disorder, we're going to be able to see the drug diffuse into the, that center in the brain in real time in an image that we see. If we're trying to kill a tumor, well, we're going to be able to see the map of the therapy as it's happening, not come back a week later to see what happened, but in real time. So I think that that kind of revolution is we're in the midst of is really an exciting, it's really exciting to be in health. I always, you know, you see sometimes in healthcare because it's hard, there's some doctors will say, gosh, I wouldn't advise my children to go in healthcare. I always say there has been no more exciting time to be in healthcare than it is today. And I, I'm actually envious of my students who are going to be in a world that's going to be very Star Trek and very uh, futuristic. Yeah. Well, I want to invite a couple of you, too, tapping into our expertise he right here. If one of you uh, has a question in a couple of minutes, I would invite uh, a couple of questions from the audience as well. And uh, from Mayo, if, is there a question from Facebook you want to relay? A question from yes. Facebook Live. The question has to do with multiple sclerosis, and it, it's two-part. Is there any new progress in repairing the damage caused by multiple sclerosis? And the second part, is there any progress in stopping the disease? Okay, just a disclosure that uh, none of us are multiple sclerosis experts. We pride ourselves in Mayo Clinic about while we engage our colleagues, we try not to speak out of uh, school, so to speak. But that being said, I know that the, the FDA has recently ap approved a new drug for multiple sclerosis. Uh, I know uh, uh, our team at Mayo Clinic is very excited about it. Uh, our team at Mayo Clinic has been very engaged in cutting edge research uh, in multiple sclerosis. So I think my, my perception is working with my colleagues in neurology is that there has never been more hope for multiple sclerosis than there is today. And I would encourage the audience member on Facebook to reach out to Mayo Clinic to see if they can engage them. We have a very specialized, high-end multiple sclerosis team that would be happy to engage in a conversation. Great. Dr. Helms-Tillery, it was mentioned here how exciting technology is in the coming years. With your specialty in the plasticity of the brain, and you talked earlier about uh, the receptors, the dopamine levels that you study, in how concerned are you of the effect of technology on young minds and the plasticity of their brains developing? And we think of the three and four year olds who are on uh, tablets and iPhones for perhaps several hours a day. Is, it, is this something you are concerned about with your research? Uh, well, I'm not sure concern is the right word. Um, there's certainly a lot of thought about it. I mean, we know, for example, that you know, limited screen time before two years of age is probably better for attention spans later in life, things like that. Um, but in fact, you know, these technologies are pretty amazing. So um, I was watching um, a 14-month-old girl the other day with a, a, an iPhone, and she was already navigating through pictures and blowing the pictures up and down and getting onto uh, Snapchat, I think it's called, and sending Snapchats to random people, I think. Um, so, you know, um, so the... Um, the, the ability to navigate technology, I think, is, is always going to be something which to somebody like us is challenging and confusing because we're old, you know? So, but to the young people, this is just the sort of the world that they're face, faced with. And I don't really see that um, these technologies are a reason for concern. I think they're a whole new set of tools that we're gonna have to tap into and we're gonna have to be aware of as we develop our own new technologies. And so I don't see a great deal of concern about that. Um, I do wanna sort of um, take that back a little bit to the, the questions about sort of individualized medicine because I think this is really important. We, um, in my field, for example, the, neural, the very specific field of neural interfaces and trying to divide, devise interfaces which are going to, for example, play memories or play vision into the system, one of the things we find is that they never really work. So, for example, we hear a lot of things about retinal implants and um, visual cortical implants to, to play vision in. Well, what do the patients actually experience when you play those visions in? You know, they experience what's called phosphines, just a little poof of light, you know, poofs of light when you stimulate on those electrodes. Or, you know, in my field, we put on electrodes to, to stimulate the hand. And so what do the people feel report when you stimulate in areas that are supposed to provide sensation from the hand? Well, they report tingling, or they report sensations like they feel like somebody attached a string to the inside of my skin and they're pulling on the string, or just really weird stuff. And so I think we have this sort of, sort of very clear vision in this particular area that when our attempts to sort of 
um, improve or mimic this, this system, this biological system, um, they don't really work that well. But that doesn't mean they're not going to work in the long term. So, you know, we've had this long developed technology, which is cochlear implants. Cochlear implants suffer from the same kinds of, of issues, and yet people are very successful with cochlear implants. Well, why is that? It's because they practice with them, they have them for long periods of time, they get therapy, they get people who teach them what the sounds mean, they get um, feedback what those sounds mean. So in the you know, development of some of our technologies, are like uh, for sensory touches, we are now providing patients an opportunity to like tune in the stimulation the way they want it and to get it feeling the way that they want it. But even then, <clears throat> we're pretty sure that the real experience is gonna come from using those technologies. So it kind of comes back to the same issue where um, you, you need to, you have all these technologies available to you and then you have the system and I hate to sort of, um, I, don't, I agree completely that everything is physics except we have this filter between physics and us which is biology which is messy and nasty and ugly and pretty amazing and remarkable at the same time. And so well, we, what, what yeah. I heard, what I heard in there was the idea that you'd have to tune each of these for each of the individual patients, which makes sense. Well, to get sort of, yeah, absolutely, to get, yeah, absolutely, to get sort of the best possible thing you can get. Because everybody's unique. Everybody's unique, absolutely. So then, but then that doesn't quite do it. You still have to um, give the brain sort of time to learn how to use these things. Dr. Bender. Well, uh, I have two comments on technology. One is, um, I think there's two important issues to keep in mind One for the, for the for our species. One is uh, the recent Harvard study, 75-year study on health, the longest-running study on human health, showed a very important point that the quality of our relationships is what matters. And that may be funny coming from a neurosurgeon, but um, I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. The quality of relationships is really what dri is uh, an important driver of human health. And the second is when you look at brain recovery and brain function optimization, it's the degree to which you engage in active participation with your environment or uh, one way to look at that is when you look at people who retire, let's say, and if, if, you ran, if you look at the people who stay home and just watch TV versus those who stay engaged and working their brain in multiple domains, they tend to have better cognitive function long term. So why is that important to a neurosurgeon? What's happened now in society is that we're all on our cell phones, and to the degree that cell phones and technology drive us away from each other, I think that's bad for teams, it's bad for humanity. So we've thought actually about giving people a heads-up display when they're walking around the hospital. Well, imagine how disruptive that would be if I walked into a patient room with, a, with goggles on where I'm seeing Google Glass. Immediately, it isolates me from the nurse, from the patient. But imagine if we dropped the whole idea of screens. Maybe that was a bad idea in human history. No, we should move away from screens and move to a hologram. At the dinner table now, you'll find we've banned at our home during dinner uh, devices, but in, oftentimes I would find my kids on their devices and you know, I'm on my device and that's a bad thing. Uh, but imagine if it was a hologram and my son, let's say, is passionate about soccer and the, it's, a, it's a World Cup, and we actually bring up a hologram of the World Cup. Well, now all of a sudden, you're, you're appealing actually to what makes Homo sapiens strong. What made us as a species powerful is the ability to work in a team, what people say, gather on a campfire and tell stories. Perhaps we were stronger when we sent letters to each other versus using email and uh, whatever the du jour uh, communication method is. So my point is, let's use technology to make us stronger, build better teams, and not become slaves of technology, and not use it to isolate us. And that's, that would be my word of caution. If you have any ideas on how to enforce those technology bans, I'm, I'll be <laughs> happy to get them. Questions out here in the audience, yes. Good morning. Hi, John Kevin. This is from Mayo Clinic. One question I have, I know all three of you have students and trainees of, of various sorts, and so my question is, I mean, if you could, if you could wave a wand, how would you change the training of the students before they get to you to better take advantage of uh, uh, innovations in, in neuroscience? Less pillared. Less, less, less what? Less pillared, less siloed, less less formalized into one specific area. Um, I think people having, um, you know, it's like the old terminology about liberal arts education versus, you know, science only. It's that same concept, but applied m m kind of in an area. Um, I think people come from, especially once they get through like the PhD level, uh, it's true that people get into a certain a silo. And, and part of that silo is the field that they're 
person that trained them is in, but also where their future career paths are in. So that's one of the things that I think we were trying to do here at Mayo, is trying to build opportunities for people that are at this, these sort of interfaces and um, build career paths that support where those students would go. So you can teach them just fine to be able to, to interface at um, multiple, what would be con traditionally considered multiple disciplines. Um, I'm, I think I'm a poster child for that. But um, what you can't, what you can't um, do is then <laughs> leave them to the wild and not have them have an opportunity. So I think it's, a, it's a, one coming in, I think it's making sure that they're not um, siloed um, and that they understand that there's diverse opportunity at a variety of interfaces between di different um, otherwise non-intersecting non topics. Um, and then um, making sure that we, we support that by making their big career paths. Yeah, I think those are great comments. I think I love what ASU is doing with innovation, the idea of measuring, Michael Crow will say he measures the university based on the innovations and contributions to society. It's a different way of measuring uh, the impact of a university and maybe takes us back to why universities arose in the first place. And, and so I think the idea that, you know, when I was a medical student, undergrad, I'm sorry, I had check boxes, must take MCAT, must, must major in biology, and there was a certain path. And I think we have to, I think we have to, create sort of a, a societal curriculum for innovation and to really start to teach innovation, encourage innovation, and we have to start young. I mean, I didn't know anything about being a neurosurgeon until I went to medical school. I think the idea of mentorship has to start younger. Uh, so really creating a bridge between schools. Are schools really teaching what is actually gonna be useful to society in 20 years? That's a question that all schools are posing now, and I think, and I think one of the ways to bridge is to tear down the wall between you know, practicing doctors, let's say, and middle schools and high schools and really bringing that together. The other thing I'm, I'm passionate about is really bridging with the humanities. I mean, we kind of discourage our budding scientists from going to the, you know, from being engaged in arts and mu the soft sciences, so, quote unquote. And really, if you think about the genius of Apple was bridging the, you know, what Steve Jobs always talked about is bridging the humanities with technology. That's what made Apple special. And I think that's what makes Mayo special. The idea that we, we have a piano in the lobby, and we're, we've always been passionate about engaging with the arts and the you know outside of because it's more to being a human than just I will I will remove your brain tumor, I will check a scan, you know I will do this mechanical function. But really, we ask our patients increasingly now, who are you as a human being? Are you an artist? Are you a scientist? Part of it is the scientific side of it of mapping the tracks. So I think art is going to come back and meet humanities, and I would love to see undergraduate curricula talk about brain mapping and linking it back to the humanities and, and really what are we about as, a, as, as human beings. And I think that will create better doctors of the future. We have a question here from an ASU researcher. How do you do? I'm Bill Petusky at Arizona State University. I oversee the Advanced Materials Initiative. Uh, it seems like every tech, field of technology is aggressively moving into the applications of data management, decision systems, uh, machine learning. And I'd like to know what is the state of activity in the neurosciences, which I imagine you're very actively involved in. So d data science and AI is huge. Anything in the spectrum, data science all the way to AI, right, being a, a very specific realization of data science um, is, is huge, right? Um, and so that's part of that pragmatic challenge of generating patient-specific predictions, right? It, it's complex. It's, no, no one says it's easy, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, your physician, you have a, a EMR, which is like a vast BM, like vast cavity of, of zeros and ones, right? It's information um, about the patient and, and could be in the form of images, could be in the form of the dr uh, te blood test, could be in the form of urine tests, could be in the form of a million different things, different um, and demographics. Um, but on the other side, you have um, biological understanding, which you've got to somehow merge and overlay that onto this, right? And so AI and um, data science is huge um, in this area because you want to learn some information from all of that data, and that's uh, one component of it. But the other thing is, is uh, I, this is the example I've been using, and I don't know if it's a great example, so I'm, I'm willing to be countered, countered on this, is um, you know you're on Facebook and you have an Amazon window open and you order some diapers for your new niece or something, right? And the next thing you know, Facebook now thinks you're pregnant and because they keep on sending you ads that you're, you're pregnant or you, you now have a small child, right? You see the disconnect. So once you take the data, which is on the Facebook side, um, you synthesize it through a machine learning, data science, et cetera, you can get the, the, the 
the conclusion, oh, you must be pregnant, but if you overlie the biological understanding, some, some basic model about biology, about how biology works, you know, oh, actually not. Um, so uh, that's the idea <laughs> behind the difference between what I, what I what we tried to describe about where data science, where I see the future of data science, data science, artificial intelligence, and mechanistic modeling. And what I described to you before has been some sort of mechanistic modeling. What biology do we understand? Can we write down some equations to, to, um, to describe that biology and use that m equation or set of equations to view the data through that lens? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So we, we, uh, I'll tell you just two uh, small short stories along those that I think will partly answer your question. One is we, we uh, you know, when you look at back pain, back pain is probably the number one complaint uh, to doctors worldwide. And the challenge is some people with back pain have an emergency. Many patients just need physical therapy. Some people need surgery at some point. Uh, some people may need uh, certain types of weight loss or uh, certain types of exercise, et cetera, et cetera. It's a huge cause of disability, et cetera, and it's a big problem. So when we get phone calls at Mayo Clinic, part of our challenge is knowing how do we match the right patient to the right doctor at the right time? So we recently worked with ASU on a machine learning project where we took uh, concepts from industrial engineering to basically say, okay, if we ask some certain questions and build a machine learning algorithm, can we become smarter about getting the patient to the right doctor? Because everybody's time, time is valuable and, and you, wanna, you don't want to go to the Mayo Clinic if you, you just need physical therapy and ha see the surgeon or vice versa or you may need to see both. And how do, we, how do we become smarter about that to deliver very precise care to a patient? And so along those lines, we were able to predict with about 70 to 80% accuracy from four simple questions whether somebody actually needed surgery. That's very important to know because why waste your time with a surgeon when, you know, and so on. So, and that's just a micro example of how we're linking ASU and Mayo. The other very important, and actually this, this second story answers a lot of the earlier questions. So if we look at MS, uh, degenerative brain diseases, dementia. One of the failures of healthcare is that we've been looking too late in the process. So we, we, we start to give dr uh, trial drugs when people are in their 70s or 80s when the disease has been progressing for d several decades. And to no surprise, the drugs don't work. Well, the new exciting thing, Mayo Clinic now has one of the biggest repositories of imaging and patient cohorts of what we call preclinical disease. So patients in their 40s who have mild cognitive decline. Well, by layering on artificial intelligence, which we're doing to study the images, we may pick up things that a human eye won't, under, won't pick up. That requires looking at large, massive databases of patients to say, okay, that little tiny finding on the MR that people didn't even notice could wind up being an important predictor of who could benefit from an early trial of either phys uh, cognitive therapy or intervention or perhaps a brain stimulator, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, uh, and, and, and along those lines, you asked a question, how are we well positioned in the Valley? Well, one of the strengths of Mayo Clinic is our integration across Rochester and Florida. So we're the, we're the only national medical center. And so, in fact, on that frontier, our, our, on those two fronts, those two stories, we're actually linked not only to ASU, but to Rochester, which has been for the last 150 years collecting data on patients, imaging, and clinical, that is a huge, uh, when you talk about, our, the biggest opportunity for AI is to layer on AI algorithms onto huge databases that will shed light on things that we as humans would have never noticed, uh, or would take so long for us to notice that it, it would be irrelevant. We have a question from Arizona State Senator Nancy Bartow. Thank you so much. Uh, this is just a fascinating and encouraging uh, discussion, thank you. Um, I'm curious what innovations are happening regarding uh, the severely afflicted mentally ill at the Mayo. Uh, so that, that is obviously a very important question for society, a um, very important question for humanity, and there's obviously a spectrum of that. And I think one of the things, uh, and it, it ties a little bit into what I said earlier about um, the preclinical phases of things. I think we don't do a good job as a medical profession in terms of diagnosing these issues at a much younger age, a much younger stage, so we can intervene proactively. So I think the, uh, the Mayo system is very interested in that preclinical phase, and there's a lot of active research going on that, whether it's from an imaging perspective or clinical perspective. I think also the idea of rehab. Rehab, for the history of rehab, and we have some rehab leaders in the room, uh, what, and I, I'm using the word rehab in a very broad sense, not just uh, in terms of, you know, pe people think of rehab as just 
somebody injured their arm, they need to recover. But rehab in terms of its broader uh, of brain uh, interventions that lead to better health and better coping. Are, for example, one, one example is our uh, three-week high-intensity uh, chronic pain, which is one form of uh, a mental challenge. Uh, and in terms of not just looking at the problem from one drug or one therapy, but really bringing together the psychology, the imaging, the clinical background, et cetera, et cetera, into a comprehensive approach. I think that's another area where we failed in healthcare, where the Mayo model could have some impact. The idea that um, traditionally, when people with mental illness have typically been ha have had siloed care, whether it be with a psychiatrist or a social, and we really haven't brought it together as a society. And I mean, in a much broader sense. And I think the Mayo model of team care could have potentially a big positive impact on that frontier. A very important challenge in frontier. On, on the science side, I think I think the the thread on that regard goes back to the very first of this piece of this conversation, which had to do with how do you build models that understand what the brain is doing when it's not doing it properly, and 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 use that to help hone these interventions. Right, the analogies that we've laid out here for in brain tumors, right, you can uh, do the same thing for thinking of it from a dysfunction of any system. Uh, you can there's a lot of active research in that area, and um, that's something that I think Mayo is very attuned to um, adapt into the into the clinic. Uh, if I can add, I'm uh, Dr. Cron. I'm one of the Mayo Clinic psychiatrists. Two other things that we are doing that I'd like to highlight is our colleagues in Rochester have been running a biobank for patients with bipolar disorder, and our Arizona team has contributed to that. And that's actually yielding some very interesting research findings, and it's been underway for about a decade now. Um, the other thing that we have really excelled at for many years are for patients with serious mental illness who have coexisting medical illness. And that's a very neglected group of patients. So our transplant team, our cancer team, um, is better equipped to help people who have both psychiatric and medical illness than other institutions. And it speaks to the teamwork that we've been able to work at that interface. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cron. Thank you. In the couple of minutes we have left, I want to give each of you the chance to sort of punctuate any, any idea you would like to leave us with. And just offer up this question if you'd like to answer it. What do you see as the greatest threat uh, today to lo our long-term brain health or the greatest uh, public health risk? Well, uh, one thing I would like to sort of revisit a little bit was uh, Dr. Kavanagh's question about um, education. And I think uh, a key thing that we're trying to do at ASU is instead of focusing on sort of skill sets, which is the traditional method, you're a mechanical engineer, you're a chemist, or you're a biologist, instead to focus on problems, to gather people around the question, to say, okay, well, maybe we're interested in, say, bipolar disorder, and we want to understand sort of the aspects of bipolar disorder, maybe dis decide what kind of technologies can be brought to bear to help it, what kind of um, uh, rehabilitative technologies, all these kinds of things. Well, it comes back to s something that was uh, mentioned earlier about patents. You know, patents have these long lists of people, it's because we need lots of different sort of skills to, to bring into these things. So I think one of the key things that um, we're trying to focus on at ASU, which I think is not, it's not a well-developed skill yet, is teaching people how to work in teams, you know, and how to communicate across these very broad boundaries between people who are artists and humanists and people who are scientists and engineers, and to sort of breach those boundaries. So I think that's a huge challenge that we face in, for example, the School of Engineering at ASU, I think it's a challenge that's um, faced broadly in trying to understand and approach some of these major issues that are facing us in the world today. So, I, I would I would like to um, I think close with um, the and hope that you can take home this this message, which is um, basically that although the brain is unbelievably complex, right? Uh, we can't even count how complex it is, right? It's it's a number that's way uh, bigger than we can make sense of, um, and biology is complex. And Medicine is complex and everything is complex. But our world, if, if anything, look back 10 years, right? This Facebook example, which I kind of, you know, joked about, right? That tells you, shows you the transformation of how we've approached life day to day. The degree to which we were staring at our, <laughs> our, 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 um, our phones, you know, 10 years ago were radically different, 20 years ago, radically different, right? So in a very short period of time, I want us to appreciate how quickly things have changed and how we've assimilated so much information into simple devices like our iPhones, right? So um, 
my point is that um, as complex as the brain is, as complex as medicine is, as complex as biology is, there are still rules that, w that are within that system that we can use and either glean from things like artificial intelligence uh, data science or, um, or glean using sort of mechanistic approaches that we've t talked about before that can generate accurate predictions for patients. And I think that truly um, uh, is the revolution that I hope that we can uh, lead with Mayo Clinic. Uh, as they say, culture beats strategy. And I think the opportunity is that we, as a city of Phoenix, the state of Arizona, can create a culture that makes innovation one of our hallmarks. And there's a, there's an, in, the, in terms of the threat, I think there's one, one mythology that we have to be careful about as a society. And that is, we tend to believe, and we're all, I think we all do this, and I do it, that innovation is automatic. Innovation is just natural, progress of humanity is on, we're on a passive boat going down the river called innovation. It turns out that innovation is actually uphill, not downhill. It turns out that there was a long, dark period of human history after the pyramids. And if you walk through Rome, it's hard to imagine that the dark ages came after that. And so we have, at every year, every time point in human history, we have a bifurcation. We have to actively decide and not passively decide, because if we're passive, we may drift down the wrong river. Uh, and so along those lines, I just want to go back to the idea of team and the idea, the theme that our greatest strength as a society, whether it's Mayo Clinic or as a larger society, is a team model. We often talk about the team model at Mayo Clinic as internal, meaning doctors working amongst each other. But the Mayo brothers spent a lot of time on the weekends, going back to the river analogy, drifting down the river in their steamboat, engaging communities in the Midwest and beyond and that engagement is, I think, what this day is about. When I see this room, I have hope, we have hope, because it means that community leaders are coming together to embrace innovation, to embrace progress, to embrace what's going to be better for our children and their children. Thank you. Thank you for your insight and your optimism, and you give us a lot of reason, I think, to be inspired, too, about this uphill journey through innovation with the Mayo Clinic. And we want to also thank all of you for being here and our 11,000 or so uh, viewers on, on Facebook who have also joined in this discussion. If you have any complaints, you can send them to Dr. Uh, Benduck. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he has an email somewhere on there. No. But again, thank you very much, everyone, for being here.